Hi, everybody. I want to welcome you all to the first webinar in our series titled Our Daughters, Our Future, an educational series exploring girls' mental health and wellness. We have a total of five webinars in this series, each on a different topic, and each featuring a renowned expert in the field. We're offering this series because at Gateways, we recognize that mental illness and challenges to children's social emotional health are as much of a barrier to learning as more traditional disabilities like dyslexia or ADHD. We also recognize that too often mental illness is people, especially people in the Jewish community do not like to talk about, and there's a stigma attached, a belief that mental illness should be kept quiet. But we believe that the more people understand about mental illness and play a role in supporting our young people, the better off those who are suffering will be. And this ultimately is why we're running this series. First, to raise awareness and reduce the stigma around mental illness. And second, to give all of us insight into the strategies we can use to support the young people in our lives. Today's webinar will focus on the dual mental health challenge of anxiety and depression. And most importantly, how we can support our children to navigate through what can be a debilitating cycle that prevents so many teens from learning and living a full life. We're so grateful to the Miriam Fund of Boston's Combined Jewish Philanthropies for sponsoring this series. The Miriam Fund is committing to creating a world that expands opportunities for women and girls. And Gateways is committed to work, and in particular, this to making life for girls and young women in our community a little bit better. Our agenda this evening is to hear first Ada Bromberg, who will share the story of living with anxiety and depression, followed by Nancy Kislin, a national expert on teens and parents on issues of anxiety and depression. And we encourage you to use the chat box to ask questions or offer your thoughts as the speakers present. After Nancy finished, um, my colleague Rachel Shine will take a minute to engage in dialogue with Nancy, posing the questions you've asked throughout. So without further ado, I want to turn over the program to Dr. Rachel Shine to introduce the speakers. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Dr. Rachel Shine. I am a clinical psychologist um, in the greater Boston area. Um, and uh, do some consulting to the Jewish community, uh, Jewish camps, and have been for um, a number of years. I'm thrilled to be working with Gateways uh, this year, coordinating this webinar series. Um, so I would first like to introduce Jada Bromberg. Um, Jada is a teen from Fairfax, Virginia. She is 17 years old um, and has lived experience with anxiety and depression, which she will share with us um, tonight. Uh, Jada has been working with an organization called This Is My Brave, which we are partnering with, partnering with which is a wonderful organization um, that promotes um, storytelling of individuals with lived experience with mental health and mental illness. And she has um, been working with them for about seven months. And she is the president of her school's Our Minds Matter Club, um, with, which is another mental health nonprofit that works directly with um, This Is My Brave. So I am thrilled to introduce Jada Bromberg and welcome Jada. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, I'm Jada. And I'm just going to start at the beginning. So I was diagnosed with anxiety and depression when I was 13. And I was a very happy kid. Um, I loved doing all sorts of things. I was very adventurous. Um, in elementary school, I played basketball for four years. And I uh, got involved in chorus because I love singing. Um, I've been singing my entire life ever since I was really little. And so in fourth grade, I got involved in the choir in my school. And then um, I also got involved in some theater because I, I enjoyed doing musicals and some plays. So I suffered for months before getting treatment or before telling anyone um, about how I was feeling, but I didn't really know how I was feeling. Um, I, I was so excited to start middle school. So seventh grade, I was I was absolutely thrilled to be out of my elementary school because I was there for six years. 
So it's the longest um, grade school where you're in the same school. So just new, ad uh, new adventure and new things in middle school were really exciting to me. And I had my bat mitzvah um, the 1st of October that year. And so I guess I'm gonna go into the fall of seventh grade where my appearance started to shift. And one thing that I was super excited about um, for being in middle school is that my parents started to let me wear makeup. And I, I mean, I've always been like a fashionista as my mom would call me. And I would wear a pink lipstick to school. And I was, I was just, I was myself and I, I loved uh, who I was and, and I, that was, that was one of the things that made me different from most people because not most seventh graders did not wear pink lipstick to school every day, but that was me. Um, and then I guess one of the first things that I, I didn't notice myself, but that my mom noticed, and this was uh, about like three months after I had started like feeling kind of sad every day. Um, is that I stopped wearing makeup and my pink lipstick. I, I stopped wearing that. Um, I had a lot of peers making fun of me for it. And, and I guess I kind of let that get to me. But in my head, like it wasn't really a big deal. I kind of blew it off. I just thought I, I was done with the, the phase of my lipstick. Um, and then I, I started to just dress differently. And so I, I loved dressing up, but then I, I kind of got unmotivated to dress up so I started just like wearing sweats and dark clothing and and I kind of just I didn't really have the energy to try um and so I kind of saw that myself as as just typical teens like I was I had just turned 13 um also in October and and I was just like okay this is the teen years like people say teens are moody and stuff so um so I didn't really think too much of it. And then I, I, I didn't really have a friend group either. Um, I had a few close friends from elementary school, but in middle school, things kind of changed. Just people were trying to find their different friend groups. And, and so it was, it was different um, because you didn't always have like the same people from your elementary school and your middle school classes. Um, it was nice meeting a lot of new people, um, but but I didn't feel like I had very close friends. So I guess I started to think that, oh, I, I don't have a good friend group. Like I, I mean, I didn't really have a friend group at all. And I was looking around and I saw that it seemed like everyone else had their friends, their friend groups, they were walking around school all day with. And, and I kind of just felt like I was a floater. And, and, I, and I was, um, I, I talked to a lot of different people and I got along really well with my peers. But I just didn't have that, those like few friends that I was talking to all the time, um, and to me that felt kind of like like I was I was being left out because no one wanted me in their friend group, so I started to see it as as oh no one likes me and and so that really affected me because kind of just the way that I saw myself, um, so I didn't really know like how to deal with that and and I did have peers who were struggling before before I started noticing anything about myself. And they would tell me about, about um, how they were feeling with their mental health. And I mean, no one really talked about it before then in elementary school, like it just wasn't brought up. Um, but in middle school, uh, I just had some other other uh, classmates who would, who would come and talk to me. I, I mean, I would say myself, I'm a very approachable person. Um, and so I really, I really liked that people were uh, comfortable enough to talk to me. So I had uh, specifically two friends who um, were struggling with self-harm and depression. And, and because I didn't have experience, I didn't really know what the right thing was to say to them. So I really tried to just give them my support and be there for them. And, and if they were ever in danger, like I would tell them that they need to get help and talk about it with someone because there's only, only so much I can do um, as being the same age as them in seventh grade. And so I then, I then started just feeling kind of 
gloomy and sad as I was talking about before. And this was this was kind of at the same time um, as as like my my friends were struggling, maybe a little afterwards it might have started like right after, but it was kind of continuing on. So I, I didn't really know why I felt that way. So I pushed it away. Um, I pushed away the sad feelings and I tried not to think about it because I was like, well, I, I mean, these peers that are struggling, like they have depression, but I don't have depression. So I kind of just tried to suppress my feelings because I thought like it wasn't really, it wasn't as big of a deal as, as other people. I would, I would compare myself to others. And so I want to go into my depression and kind of just tell you how that felt. And it feels like just a heavy weight um, on my shoulders, in my head. Um, my head feels clogged. Uh, th this was for months, for months um, at a time, kind of on and off. But I was just very exhausted. I didn't have motivation and I had low mood and poor self-esteem. And, and I would never admit to that because I was like, I have great self-esteem. I used to wear pink lipstick. Um, but that changed and I, I literally did nothing. I ended up doing literally nothing. Um, I stopped singing and doing music. I also play piano. Um, I... I just, I kind of like, I was just like, why, why am I doing anything? I feel like this and I don't have the energy to do anything else right now. So that's kind of the state that I, I was stuck in for a long time. And then the anxiety, which I think that I kind of developed later on, but it was there. I just didn't exactly realize it consciously, I believe. Um, but that was just constant worry of what other people think of me and going back to like the friend groups and all of that and sitting at lunch. I, I sat alone um, for like the second half of that year because I was like the people I was sitting with, they weren't really talking to me. So I was like, so they don't like me if they don't talk to me. But I also didn't exactly try to talk to them as well. So I think I was, I was isolating myself. And so I... I ended up starting to believe, and this was this was more later on, but it was there. It's just I'm I'm more like conscious of of my thoughts and feelings. So I thought that I was just not good at anything, um, and because I stopped singing, I wasn't practicing my singing. But I thought that I was not a good singer anymore, which is what made me feel even more unmotivated because I was like, well, now I suck at singing, so I'm not gonna sing. <laughs> And, and I was just really kept in that loop. And so school pressure as well was just that, that was a really big deal to me. Getting A's was a really big deal to me because I felt like unless I was perfect, no one would like me. And that was kind of the default about um, everything at that time. And my parents were, were not like, oh, you have to get A's all the time. Like they, they were like, as long as you try your best and you work your hardest, like that's the best you can do. And, and I'm very fortunate to have parents who are like that because there's a lot of parents, especially in my area where it's very rigorous um, in school that, that they were able to accept that and, and be okay with me not getting 100% all the time because that's how you learn. So I just started believing that I was a terrible person and, and ultimately I felt that I was undeserving to be happy and loved and live life. So I was in a very, very dark place at that time. And, and I've been in and out of dark places. My depression for a long time was just like very low consistently. Um, and then I would get a week of happiness and then kind of go back or I'd have like a few days, like it was just very unpredictable. Um, it was like I woke up one morning and I was happy or sad and that's how the rest of the day was. So I, I had a lot of people also who, who would always tell me how happy I was. They'd be like, oh, you have so many friends. You're such a happy person. You do so many things. And, and I would be like, what? I don't have any friends. Like no one likes me. And they'd be like, what are you talking about? And, and so my thought process was that, okay, you're telling me that I have all these friends, but 
everyone's telling me I have all these friends. So who are my friends? Like, you can tell me, like, the people saying that were not very close to me either. So there's just a lot of, a lot of things about like people making assumptions of you and, and that was just bothersome. And, and although my, my mind was kind of telling me one thing and only, only pinning it on, okay, no one likes me. So that's kind of the end of that. So I didn't exactly like open up to the thought of, oh, maybe I do have people who I talk to or friends that um, are in my classes or this or that. So a huge thing during that time is that I could never pinpoint what, what it was that caused my depression. I just started feeling sad and hopeless one, one day. I mean, I don't know if it wasn't like one day I just woke up and I was like, oh no, I'm depressed. But, but over a period of time and now looking back, things were shifting, but I wasn't really, I wasn't noticing it myself because I just thought that it was, it was whatever, it was teenage stuff. So once I was just in a very, very dark place, I began self-harming and I, I hid it from my parents and I don't even know why I did it. Um, I think I just didn't want to feel how I was feeling. And so that was something that I, I used to cope with my emotions. And so a couple of weeks later, I admitted it to my parents, kind of. Um, we were sitting at dinner and they were just kind of asking me like, uh, how I was, how I've been feeling. They said that they've been noticing that in my changes, like my mom is saying, oh, you're not wearing makeup anymore. Like, why is that? And I was just like, oh, I, I don't know. I'm not really into it anymore. Um, but then she asked, have you ever thought about hurting yourself? And, and I, I was going to say no. Um, but I had, I had known like two weeks before or whatever I've done it. I did it uh, a few times before in that period of time. And I was like, okay, I can't just sit here and lie to her. So I admitted, I, I said, yes, I have. And I, I had self-harmed um, a couple of weeks ago. And my parents were like, what? <laughs> like they, they didn't expect it at all. And I mean, I didn't expect it from myself exactly. <laughs> but um, they were like, okay, you have to seek, we have to seek a therapist right, right away. Like, I think the next day they called, um, this was like at night. So the next day they were already on it. And next thing I remember, I was sitting in a therapist's office and, um, kind of goes from there. Um, so I, I have a song that I wrote called at the edge and, this talks about, well, the lyrics in it describe like that heavy feeling of depression and then my anxiety. And, and so songwriting, when I was 13 also, I started writing songs because once I started getting back into music, I, I went back into it because I, I needed to get my emotions out. I had been journaling a lot. And so I decided, okay, I'll write and make it into a song. And so I started doing that and then and then I just continue it, continued with it. I still write songs to this day. So I'm going to share that song with you. And it is very deep and personal. And, and the point of the song is that I want you to feel the emotions that I was feeling at that time and, and understand like the anxiety and in, in everything that was going on and the at the edge of of not knowing like, okay, what's going to happen today? Like, am I going to feel okay or am I not? So I'm going to be, go to my piano and be back in like three seconds. <laughs> Okay, now I'm not on mute. Okay, cool. So this is at the edge. Oh, my head's cut off, that's funny. <laughs> Oh, the eye in the corner I choose. 
Okay, I'll be like right back. <laughs> All right, I was muted. Um, okay, so I just wanna talk a little bit quickly about like more of the recovery side. Um, Cause that was from like a very dark time um, as you could hear from <laughs> the lyrics. So I have had a very strong support system the entire time. Um, my parents have always been very supportive of me and here for me always and and they were, I think, the biggest part of what helped me, um, what helped me with with my recovery of self harming, especially because we made a pact that I had to always tell them um, if I ever did it again. And and I mean, I did it plenty of times, but I did tell them every single time because because to me, like I I mean, I just I am an honest person, and and I. I had to tell them. I couldn't keep it from them anymore. Once they already knew part of it, I kind of just all of it started to come out. So my parents, my counselors, therapists, psychiatrists, um, they have all been the hugest part of my recovery. And I mean, I mean, I guess the biggest thing I want you to know is that you should ask your kid how they're doing. Um, and and even if you think, oh, my kid would never, never feel this way. That's what I thought. <laughs> Um, and it, it kind of snuck up on me. It happened gradually over time. And even I wouldn't have thought about it for myself, but if someone else sees it and says, oh, maybe we should get some help, um, then you can catch things earlier before, before they start, if they do self-harming, before, before it kind of gets to that deep, dark um, depression, anxiety, or, or whatever um, they're feeling. And so different methods work for different people. I've tried many different things. Um, and it, it takes a lot of hard work. And, and for me, I think one of the biggest things has been reframing my mindset. I've just had a very negative mindset. Um, and I still work on that to this day, just thinking kind of like all or nothing thinking of one person doesn't like me, it means no one likes me. Like it's a lot of that and just thinking for a sec during those times, okay, let me let me try to reframe this and and put it in a different context of okay, maybe not everyone doesn't like me, um, and and kind of almost try and block out the the people who are not going to be building you up if they're just trying to tear you down. They probably have something going on themselves, and and so it it's uh, important to 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 stay true to yourself and, and uh, see like yourself for who you are because no one knows you better than yourself. It's just, you have to believe in yourself and like, and see, um, just kind of like accept how you're feeling and, and when you're not feeling well, accept that for yourself. Even if you, if you, even if you don't tell anyone else, like at that very moment, like if once you know that something is wrong, then you will go in and seek help and tell someone because because you're aware of it. So I I mean I I've, I've done a lot of different things, especially over these past few months. But I am involved with this is my brave and our minds matter with my school, and we're working to end the stigma around mental health because because there's such a big stigma of it, and people don't want to people don't want other people to know if they have a mental health condition because because they think they'll be seen differently or or there's just a lot there's just a lot of stigma around it and in getting help because they think they might be weak but if you're going to get yourself help you're very strong because to admit that you're feeling a certain way the only way to get better is is to ask for help um, from people before it declines so I also have done journaling, uh, as I said earlier, um, and I've been doing that for years now, but uh, in this past few months, I started blogging and doing poetry, especially during COVID. And, and I picked up some, a lot of new things um, in coping skills. Um, and then my, my music, most of all, is my biggest coping skill and something that I know I can turn to. So um, 
having at least one coping skill that you know works for you or your child knows works for them, something they can go to, whatever it is, um, it's important to have at least one thing because you need to have something there. If you don't have anything there, then that's that's when it can result in um, in negative behavior and stuff. So really just channeling my emotions into something I love and and I mean, accepting my past because I've been through a lot and, but also knowing that like, it does get better. Um, and that's hard to remember, especially in the moment, like um, in those really dark times. Yeah, I thought, no, this is never gonna get better. But, but if, you, if you don't try, then it's going to take longer to get better because, because if you're not trying, you're not going to go like help yourself. And, and so, the biggest thing is that you need to do that. And then you also need other people to be there for you. So that kind of concludes what I have. And I really hope that you enjoyed listening to me and my song and everything I had to say. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Jada. Um, I am so appreciative of you being with us. Um, and thank you so much for sharing your story and your beautiful music. And um, it's been wonderful to, to get to know you a little bit. Um, so I now have the privilege of introducing um, Nancy Kislin. Um, Nancy is a licensed independent clinical social worker as well as a marriage and family therapist um, in New Jersey. And I have actually known Nancy for many, many years, um, but this gave us the opportunity uh, to reconnect. Um, so Nancy has an expertise in working with uh, teens and parents and helping them navigate um, through the stresses and anxieties of life. Uh, she wrote the book, Lockdown, Talking to Your Kids About School Shootings or School Violence. Um, and I believe she has another book in the works these days. Um, she recently appeared on CNN um, and has helped um, hundreds of youth and parents and families um, kind of navigate through, through life. And all roads lead back to the Jewish community because I know Nancy from Eisner Camp. So um, we get, you know, it shows the, the power of community and connection as well. All right, Nancy, take it away. You there, Nancy? Oh, Nancy, we can't hear you. Now, can you hear me? All right, now we can hear you, great. Sorry, sorry, apparently. So first I wanted to say thank you, Rachel, for thinking of me and inviting me here and uh, love that our connection goes back to Eisner. And also a special thank you to Jada. That was incredible sharing. It's hard for me to follow that. Um, and just applause to you for your bravery, for your courage, and for your mission, for educating all of us. So to everyone, just take a deep breath, take a couple of deep breaths and shake, shake a little bit and move, because that was intense. And I'm sure all of us were, were moved by the power of, of her words. So tonight, we're going to talk about how do I help you raise resilient teens, resilient children in this most unusual time. So I start with, I am a daughter. I am a mother of two amazing young women. I am a child and adolescent psychotherapist, a parent coach, a researcher, a teacher, a professor, an author, but really I'm just Nancy. And I'm on this mission to help anyone I can that I'm fortunate enough to meet along the journey to help kind of navigate this Thing we call life. And I know so much of my work comes from my own struggles, my own 
journey as a young person growing up. And in my day, we were just called shy. But really, what is shy? Shy is just another word for anxious. I was that incredibly anxious child. And I find that so many things are the same that when we talk about anxiety and depression and all those things, but yet the world that you're raising these children in is so much more complicated than when I was growing up, than maybe when you were growing up, even when I was raising my girls. So how do I help you tonight to help raise resilient kids? And I think of resiliency as almost like this magic wand um, if I hand you this magic wand and I help you raise these really strong and confident and find their voice confident people, then that is the best defense we have against some of the mental illnesses that we talk about, against anxiety and depression and self-harming behaviors. Not that there isn't a big component of DNA and what's genetic and what's environmental, but resiliency, resiliency is something that is at all of our fingertips to a certain degree. So let's start with lockdown because I think we have to acknowledge the crisis we're living in. How can we even talk about any of this if we don't talk about the fact that we're in this really, what, eight month time period of lockdown? And this, we could talk about it as an emotional lockdown, a psychological lockdown, but what, do, what does that really mean? And just to make it simple, it means if we were sitting in a room full of uh, eighth graders, seventh and eighth graders, and I said emotional and psychological lockdown, yeah, what would they say to me? But if I said to them, wow, this world's really weird right now. Like, I don't know about you, but this mask, this mask makes it really hard for me to communicate with you. Like for someone like me who uses and loves people's expressions and not only just their eyes, but their face and, and their body language, not being able to see people's actual facial expressions is a handicap for me. So then, and I'm an adult and I'm you know, seasoned at all this work I do. So now you go back to that room of eighth graders and now we're handicapping them. Maybe not all of them, but I would say the majority of them. And that's just one example of hey, I don't know if school's gonna happen tomorrow because someone on my soccer team's dad was just diagnosed with COVID. So that might make us all not be able to play. I had a kid on the phone earlier today. He's like, yeah, I have one football game. It's my last football game on Saturday for high school. Oh, was it a good season? No, Nancy, why did I say that? Of course it wasn't a good season. He's like, no, that's our first game. And that's our last game because of COVID. So tonight, we're going to go on a journey together. I hope you will come with me because I want to empower you. I want to help you build your own toolkit, your own self-care toolkit. And then I want to help you help your child identify, just like Jada shared with us, what are things that can help? whether it's journaling, music, all the beautiful things she said are so incredibly critical right now. So let's start with you. How are you really doing? So if you're comfortable, I can't see you. I wish I could. I want everyone to close their eyes and just take a couple of deep breaths in and out. And just let your body settle it to the seat you're sitting in. If you're standing like I am, I'm just imagining that there's deep roots that leave the bottom of my feet, that take my energy. When I breathe out, it goes deep into the earth's surface. And if I need to, if I'm feeling really too much in my head and there's too much noise and too many thoughts, I might even put my hands on my heart, hand on my belly, and breathe in, and exhale out. And just center myself. 
And I'll ask it again. How are you doing? I don't know about you, but some days I'm doing fine. I'm riding the waves. And other days it feels like I'm being pulled under the waves. And then I'll get myself back on top and something else. And sure, that's life. But on the other hand, it's also really tough these days. Whoops, my chat box there. <sighs> so we hear the saying all the time, put the oxygen mask on yourself before you can help. So I hope you all have a notebook and a pen next to you. And I want you to hopefully take notes. And one of the first things I want you to do, number one is, how are you doing with self-care? What kind of rituals have you adapted since this has all changed our lives? Are you taking more walks? Are you taking any walks? Are you taking maybe a weekly bath when the kids are asleep? Are you doing something with the intention? That's a good word to write down too. What can you do with intention that will help support your body, and your mind, and your spirit? Some people pray, whatever your version of praying is. For me, it's walking and looking at the trees and putting my phone away and not looking at how many steps I took and just being really present. Next thing I want you to write down is, what brings you joy? I don't know about you, but sometimes it seems like joy, happiness, laughter, whatever you wanna call it. Sometimes does that just get pushed to the side? And for us to take care of ourselves, we have to make sure that joy is on our list. And then I want you to be the role models. I'm sorry, I put just what your daughters see, but your sons, your children, your spouses, your parents. And for some reason, I, there we go. So words that affect our mood. And I know these are words we all use in conversation all the time. You can read them, stressed out, anxious, fearful, dreading, go through the list. Now, am I on the phone with my girlfriend? I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so stressed out. I'm so dreading next week's school. I don't know how I'm gonna get. All that negativity, all that heavy energy, all that negativity. If my children were around, even the ages they are, what do you think I would be doing to their mood? What do you think I would do and be doing to their anxiety? What would I be doing? Not that I'm not entitled to have a space, not that you're not entitled to have a space to share on the phone. My goal tonight is to let you be more mindful, mindful of the words that you're saying, mindful of where you're saying it and to whom. Let's define our terms, right? We use these terms so easily and interchangeably. Anxiety. Anxiety is an emotion characterized by feelings of tension, worry, thought, and physical changes, such as increased blood pressure, sweaty palms, tingling in your arms and legs, racing thoughts. An individual may experience reoccurring intrusive thoughts or worries. There seems to be a trend among a lot of the world down here in New Jersey, where all of a sudden I have all these kids who are announcing, Nancy, did you know I have OCD? Okay. I just take a deep breath. What does that mean to you? And when I get into it, what is that? Is just a label? Like some people do have OCD, I'm not taking it away. But to a child, to a 10-year-old, to a 12-year-old, what is OCD? To me, I like to just use the word anxiety. I like to not even use that word. I like to get curious. What is your experience? What does it feel like in your body before you go and have a big exam? What does it feel like when you did something you weren't supposed to do and you know you're gonna get caught by your parents? Right? Helping your child, and you can do this, and helping yourself identify what are the thoughts that are going through your head and where am I feeling it in my body? That's what we call the mind-body connection. And that's a way to embrace the term anxiety. Um, stress. 
right? We all say we're stressed out. I try not to. Stress is a normal reaction. We, again, there might be all the physical symptoms that go along with it. Uh, I'm hearing a lot, I don't know, Rachel, in your world, if you're hearing a lot of disrupted sleep, kids who are on the screen so much that my feeling is then they're not able to shut off and then they're staying up so late and then they can't get up in the morning and they're not eating regular meal time and it's just this, the moodiness, it all adds to not a good system. Um, absolutely. You can always, did you want to say something? No, I just said it, absolutely. Right, right, okay. A lot of times I find people are really surprised when you, you explain to them that stress affects the body, right? Like I just take that for granted that people know that, but I should, especially when you're dealing with a 12 year old or a 15 year old, it affects the muscles, right? I tend to be a very holding person. Rarely will you hear me scream at someone. Sometimes I think it would be better if I screamed at people because I get lots of, you know, we get the stress pains here, things like that. Does stress look and feel different in children? Yes, sometimes it does. So childhood stress can appear in any sense, any time. I have a new kid who's starting school tomorrow and I don't know what that new child's gonna look like. And what if she starts to be best friends with my best friend and then, then, and then, then. Okay, right. How do you help your child when you see that happening, when you hear that? Stress, we'll get to that. Stress can be positive or negative changes. What we know most, what we know to be the most important, excuse me, thing that children need is safety and security. Child profoundly needs to know that they are safe. That's why they need to know you, the parent, are everything they need you to be, consistent, predictable, all of those good things. If you're a teacher, if you're the therapist in your life, again, you represent if you can represent this place of safety and security, it's an amazing gift you're giving kids. Um, you can just read through what are some of the typical things. We find that kids younger and younger are worrying about their school grades. Uh, recently, we've been uh, seeing a lot of people in town, everyone's taking walks, and a lot of the new families that have moved in with little kids, I talk to everyone, and. I am not kidding when I tell you how many parents have said to me, oh, how old were your kids when you got them tutors? And I look down and I'm like, how old's your daughter? Oh, well, she's five. Do I need to get her a tutor now? No, no, no. Because again, that goes to stress. What if that child heard the dad say that? What? What does a tutor even mean to a child? Is it a scary thing? Does that mean they're not smart? Did the parents think they're not smart? Paying attention to your words. Signs of unresolved stress in kids. Again, we go through the physical symptoms, headaches, stomach aches, uh, bedwetting. You can read through the list. What are some examples of unresolved stress that you see. Anyone wanna share? This is a good time to throw in some questions if anyone, if anyone wants. So we can bring this to sort of where are you at? If any of you are on a journey where you're worried about your kids, you're worried that their stress level is too high, that your stress level is too high and it's affecting them, I call it the, the reactivity pyramid, right? You might be worried about finances and you try to keep it from them, but all of a sudden they start worrying about not having enough friends and you worry about this. And they, and they might be totally two different things that you and your child are worried about, but yet everyone is getting closer and closer to this point of really unhealthy stress. That's where we need to do some of this, some of this intervention. Let's just real last, let's go through depression. So again, while I'm talking, just go ahead and read through. But really depression, you know, 
most of us have what I call these touch point places where you can go back into your own journey and find, hey, maybe I didn't call it depression back then, but you know, I wasn't feeling so good. I, I was bored a lot. I seem to have lost interest in things. Fear. I, th I put fear separate than the other terms that we just said, because I don't think fear has to be debilitating. I don't think fear has to stop us, right? It's how we use the language around fear. If any of you have read Brene Brown's work, it's quite fabulous. I think here's one of her quotes. We're all afraid. We just have to get to the point where we understand it doesn't mean that we can't also be brave. Right? So, so a child comes to you and says, I'm so scared about this test tomorrow. And you wouldn't say, oh, do you want me to write a note to your teacher and tell her that you can't take the test tomorrow? Would anyone do that? I hope not. My story, I grew up, I don't know how many of you, I wish I could see you all, but how many of you, you could just say yes or no, grew up in what you would say is an anxious household. Right? I am proud to say that I come from a long line of very intelligent women who also are very anxious. And recently when my daughter graduated law school, this is pre-COVID, I had a lovely party in my backyard and it was time for me to give my toast and my daughter is standing right there and my beautiful mother is right there and I welcome everyone and then I say, for those of you who don't know, my daughter comes from a very long line of very intelligent, very creative, very kind-hearted, very anxious women. I thought my mother was going to jump up and scream at me. Why? And afterwards, she said to me, Nancy, why did you have to share that? And I thought, everyone in that room, in that backyard of mine, knows us hopefully loves us, celebrates with us, and knows that there's anxiety. It's part of it, but it doesn't stop it. And it's something we're actively working with. Um, a good example, and I hope you like my stories because I believe part of parenting and part of all this parent education that I do is, is sharing of the stories. And that's probably what I mo miss most about doing these live. Um, so the story just popped in my head as I was talking about fear. And I, uh, when I was in college, I took a semester abroad and I went to Israel. And it was, uh, like many times, a scary time of what was going on in Israel. And my parents tried their darndest to convince me not to go, but there was no way I was not going. And in those days, you could actually walk right up to the plane. So my parents were with me right before I boarded and my mother hugs me and she says, you know, Nancy, it's not too late to turn around. You don't have to go. And I was like, mom, I have to do this. And I remember sitting on the plane, feeling sick to my stomach, probably a headache, sweating and thinking, I can't do this and trying to calculate if I had enough time, if I jumped up right then, if I could run off the LL plane and make it back to my parents before they left the airport. That is the kind of anxiety that is not necessarily so productive for kids. What would have been helpful is, hey, acknowledge, write that down on your paper, acknowledge it's okay to be scared of new things. It's okay to feel uncomfortable. It's, it's what we do with it. I wish I could see you guys nodding or not. Anyone okay out there? So how do we cope? How do we cope with all this anxiety? And again, here's another great quote. We all have pattern, we all have pattern ways of managing our day-to-day -day anxiety. And these patterns reflect the roles and expectations of our first families. So for example, I just shared my stories with you in a hope to trigger you to think about what are some of the stories that you remember? What were you raised with? 
And why is this important? You might be saying, I don't really care what this lady's saying. It's important because it is the very fabric of who we are. And when we're put in that parenting position to that place where we parent, it's really helpful to be aware of our own journey, our own triggers, uh, things like that. Uh -oh. I don't know, are you, are you guys, are we still live? Did I can't tell, oh, okay. Anyone still there? Okay. So let's move on to, I'm not sure what just happened. Anyone else having problems or is it just my computer? Seems like something's gone on with your PowerPoint. Okay, I'm just gonna keep talking and this has never ever happened before, but maybe it's a good time. Let's just start taking questions, but I think what the next slide was going to be was talking about um, this time of trauma, right? And I wanted to go back to the word I just used, validate, take the word validate and acknowledge. And I think it's incredibly important. Sorry, I'm just getting out of all these pop-ups. Is my screen still shared? Your screen is not shared. So if you want to try to scare, share it again, if you see the PowerPoint. No, 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 stop share. All right, I'm just going to talk and we're going to pretend this isn't happening. Okay. Um, <laughs> So one of the things that's really important, I will try and put it up, nope, it just shut down completely, was trauma. So when I say that word trauma, again, is it something like, oh, that happens to other people? But the way I've researched trauma and talked about and written books on trauma is we all have our trauma story. So I just want you to stop for a second Take again, take a couple of those deep, deep breaths. And what's your trauma story? Today, I was working with a new client who presents with severe anxiety. And I shared this question. What's your trauma story? Why? And I ask you to do this work. And it's not pleasant. And I know this is heavy stuff. But it's really important. So my trauma story, I'll tell real quick. Again, I was that shy little girl. I was in first grade. I was wearing the prettiest, my favorite lavender dress, solid here with pretty flowers up here. And my mom wouldn't let me wear it to school except this was picture day, remember picture day? And I was allowed to wear this pretty dress. And I was sitting and I had the desk that you had to open and you kept your books and your pencils in there. And the teacher called on me and she said, Nancy, whatever, answer the question. And I answered it very softly. And then she said, Nancy, answer the question. And I answered it very softly. And the next time she came over and she said, Nancy, open your desk and pretend it's on fire and you have to scream to get everyone out of the classroom couldn't do it. There's nothing in me that could do that. So then she made me walk up to the front of the class and try to scream in front of the class. That didn't work either. That night when we were at dinner, the phone rang and my mother took it in the next room, but of course I could hear it. And I heard my mother and the teacher talking that they thought there was something wrong with me. For the next year, I am not kidding, I had to go to speech class with a woman and it was in the supply closet because they didn't have enough room for speech therapy back then. But the lady kept saying, you have no problem with your speech. I'm like, of course not, I'm anxious, I'm fearful. But nobody knew how to acknowledge that. That's my trauma story. Not so much that I was shy, the part that was the most traumatic and why I share it with you now is the fact, the fact that nobody understood me. Nobody knew 
not one adult in my life, not a grandparent, teacher, parent, knew the right questions to ask me. And I would have said, hey, I was afraid people were going to laugh at me. Do you know, I never wore that lavender dress again. My mom couldn't understand because I had begged and cried for that dress. And I still remember it. That's what trauma does. It makes an imprint on our brain. It doesn't mean I'm scarred, but it means that at some points in my life, probably started in social work school, that we go back to these touch points and we try to understand them. Raising resilient children, our job, all of our jobs with these children are that we help them, not that we protect them, because they're going to have trauma. Let's face it, we're all having this collective trauma right now. It's how do we create space to help them build a foundation of open communication? Okay, I'm gonna try one more time. Uh, it's not gonna it crash, let's see if it goes. So do we have any questions as I try to play with this? Anybody have any questions? I'm so glad Erin is here. So one of the things that, I'm gonna try one more time. Rachel, maybe you ask a question while I try and pull this up again. Sure. Okay. Um, sorry about that. Okay. Um, so can you talk a little bit about some ways that might be helpful to, to verbally, to non-verbally respond, verbally and non-verbally respond to people who have, who are expressing signs of anxiety and, and depression? So how, if your child, for example, if your child says to you, I, um, I don't wanna go to class tomorrow, I have a really bad stomach ache, I don't wanna go to class. Is that, well, how, do, how do you respond to that? Is that, right? So one is, yeah. Yeah. again, I'm acting like the whole world is just perfect and you're always poised to be, <laughs> to be ready for your child. I get that real life doesn't, but in a perfect world is hear what they're saying, the surface, and then be present. How many times, I don't have my phone here, but if this was my phone, I would say to you, the audience, please put your phone down right now. Your child is talking to you. Put your computer down, put your phone down. Look your child in the eyes. Often I start my programs with that question. When, when is the last time that you looked your child in the eyes? So many times kids say to me, my parents have no idea how I'm feeling. My parents are lost in their phone, things like that. So one is be present and get curious. That's a great word that I use all the time is get curious. Why is your child saying they don't want to go to school to admire? Are they, they're probably not lazy. I'm sure Rachel, you've seen so much of the research. Most kids don't want to be lazy, right? They just don't want to be lazy. That's not part of it. So what else is going on? Is there an undiagnosed learning challenge? That doesn't mean your kid's stupid. That just means they might learn in a way that's not optimal for them, especially right now through this computer. I'm finding such a rise in anxiety with so many new clients. And when I go and do a little digging, I find, oh, oh, you were diagnosed with ADD when you were 15 and nobody thought it was a big deal. Well, now you're 19 and you can't get to class or hand in a paper might be something to it, right? So the question is, how does that parent deal with that? Is it the fear that their child's anxious or they're presenting as anxious is, um, and this is if we were still on my beautiful little slice that I spend days on, we would get to three things that parents can do to help their children. Number one is routine. So if, if the, the challenge is anxiety, depression, stress, fear, that's our enemy in a way. What can you do to raise this resilient child? Because that resilient child will be better prepared to deal with all that anxiety stuff. 
Number one thing, anyone guess? Uh, routine. It goes back to what I was saying a few minutes ago. A few minutes ago, I said kids need a sense of safety, a sense of feeling secure. And that's one of the ways we do it. It seems so basic, yet it's one of the hardest things that I find. Rachel, do you find that in your work that so many families really struggle with having like routine dinners, routine rituals, I call it? Yeah, I think it's it's really, particularly when life is chaotic and stressful, um, it is hard for parents to, to set aside time to come up with, with different routines and, and to make that time special with their um, families. Can you see this now? No. No. So a question, Nancy, if you want to try to email it to me, I can try to present it. No. Um, I, um, I, so, a question for you. Um, how much should parents admit to their children that they don't know, oh, there we go, that they don't know what the answers are or how they can help? I'm sorry, repeat it one more thing. How mm -hmm. much should, should parents admit to their children that they don't know what the answers are or how they can help? So, so how much should parents admit that they don't know? Well, I'd love to know in what scenario, but I think honesty, vulnerability is great. You want your child to respect you. You want your child to honor you. You want your child to trust you. You, you, of course, have to give it back. Granted, there are scenarios where kids do things that it's hard to trust them. I'm putting that aside for a second. But to be honest is, you know, I don't know why your group of friends just stopped talking to you. I, I, I don't know why, but I can imagine that hurts so much. Um, what's another, can you think another good example of, uh, I don't know when, COVID is going to be over and life's going to go back to normal. But I do know that mom and dad are okay and we're going to keep doing all the things we need to do to keep you and your siblings safe, right? Does that answer the question? Yeah, oops, did I lose? Can you hear me? Uh, yep, yeah, you're here. Okay. Yeah, no, thank you. Yep. So the other thing is just real quick is routine. And I get, I don't know, but by you guys, but schools here are all over the place. Some are open, some are closed, some are hybrid, some are da da da. However, this fits in routine, routine, routine. If you guys don't have enough time to have good breakfast in the morning, have a good, okay, everyone come together for a half hour lunch. Up. Oh, I see families in my neighborhood during must be school lunchtime and oh, they're doing a couple of laps around the neighborhood. Everyone's gonna strip their bed at three o'clock. However that routine is, try, be creative, invite the kids participation, make it fun, find new hobbies, routine. Kids may whine and cry about it, but then they'll tell me, I know my parents make us eat dinner together. I know it's really good, right? Okay, bedtime rituals. If I had, uh, if you could see me, I would, well, I mean, if I could, I'd write, yay, big exclamation point. Know what time your kid is going to bed. Have shut off time for computer screen times. Um, you know all the stories and I could tell you millions of them where kids, pretend that they put their phone downstairs, you go to sleep, they go downstairs, they get the phone, and then they sit up all night texting. I was doing a big parent program, a couple hundred people in the audience before COVID. A woman raises her hand and says the following story. She didn't know that her daughter has middle schooler had taken the phone from the kitchen, was texting during the night. The phone rings in the middle of the night, the house phone. The mother answers it and says, hey, your daughter, I don't know if she's okay. She just texts my daughter that she wants to kill herself. And my daughter just woke us up. Is your daughter okay? 
mom goes into the daughter and the daughter was like, oh, she started to cry. I was feeling lonely. Nobody cared about me. Thank goodness it was a false alarm. But all of that would have been avoided if the child didn't have her phone, if the 14 year old didn't have her phone. Why was she feeling lonely at two in the morning? She should be sleeping. Family meals. Please have family meals a couple of times a night. Rachel, I see there's another question there. Did you want to jump in with that? Are we good? Keep going. Sorry, I was muted. Um, there are a couple of questions. So uh, first kind of related to the food question. Um, how can a parent best encourage their distressed child to eat and to eat a balanced diet? Great question. Thank you for asking. I'm sure many of you are nodding your heads. First, and I, and I say it all the time, is be the role model. If you don't sit down with the kids and you're just sort of walking all over the place and just eat a french fry here, a bite of lettuce there, be the role model. Um, try and get a sense of what else is going on. Are they going through a phase where they don't want to eat meat? Are they, did they see a movie in school that talked about the dangers of eating meat? Just get curious. Are they, um, I always say go on a field trip to the local grocery store. I know it's a little, or a farm market and see if you can engage the child in cooking because we know that when children go from touching the food, selecting the food, touching the food, preparing the food, they're more interested in eating it. If they're really refusing to eat, then that's a huge red flag. And, you know, that might be a good time that you involve someone else in the conversation. And that's if it's going on not for a day or a week, but if that's going on for a couple weeks or longer, I would, I would be curious of what's going on. Are they on a sport that they're supposed to lose weight? Again, there's so many different layers to it. Uh, do you want to add anything to that question? <laughs> No, great. There's a couple other questions. Um, could you talk about the role of accommodations and how families can avoid reinforcing children's anxious thoughts? Okay. So say it one more time. Accommodate. How to... The role of accommodation and how families can avoid reinforcing children's anxious thoughts. So um, I understand that to mean, and Nora, please correct me if I'm wrong, I understand that to mean the parent making accommodations for their, their child or accommodating the behavior and reinforcing the thoughts. Is that what you meant with that question? Sounds good. Yeah, I mean, while she's answering, I'm thinking about yeah. sort of in, when my girls were much younger, I, we all had the multicolored cups and one of my friends was over with her kids and I put down, you know, whatever cup in front of child X. And my friend said, no, she won't drink out of the blue cup. She only drinks out of pink cups. And I was like, oh, are you kidding me? <laughs> and so then I was like, okay. And I had already put the pink cup to my daughter. So I was like, oh, okay, let me take the pink cup from this three-year-old and give it to this five-year-old. But what do you think happened to my three-year-old? And my three-year-old was like, I already drank the, from that cup. So then my friend went home to get her pink cup because her child couldn't handle not having the pink cup. That story pops to mind because what is that? teaching that child. To me, that's telling that child that I don't have faith in you. I don't believe in you yes. that you have the wherewithal. I'm having trouble hearing Uh-oh, is that me? No. That, that I don't have faith in you that you can adapt to this. So again, it means how much do you become you know, you hear the short order cook, French fries, you know, are you cooking five different meals because child X doesn't like this, right? It's for me, I think the more the parent over accommodates, the more 
you're moving from raising a resilient child that's pretty flexible, that can ride the waves. Because isn't that what we want? We want the child, you give me a pink cup, give me a blue cup, I can go with it. I got it in me. Does that, does that answer the, the thing? Can you hear me okay still? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You're Number better two. Than me. <laughs> okay. Number two, right? The first thing we have people doing is routines. This is number two is consequences. This is like a dirty word in my profession. <laughs> like parents look at me and they're like, you want me to give you my kid consequences? And often more than ever, I'm hearing, you don't understand, Nancy. There's nothing I can do that will make my child make his bed, do his chores. He just doesn't care. Anyone raise their hand, put in a question about that, feel like that's true? So if you have a teen, you have a child who's saying they don't care, that's, that's, that's something to pay attention to. That's time to take a walk, just you and that child, or go for a cup of coffee, do something one-on-one -on -one time. Activity is always better than just plopping in his room and saying, talk to me. Who of us likes to talk? And, and start to get curious and engage your child in it. Not that you're the problem solver. They don't want you to problem solve everything in their life. And if they do, that's a bigger problem, right? But get curious about, you know what? We got to have some con con consequences. Uh, delayed gratification. I don't know about you, but that is a muscle that every kid needs to learn. You got to learn if you want a new Game Boy or game on your video, work for it. And this is where I go into, and it could be a whole program, but I'm going to do it really fast, is I believe that every family should create a family contract. Rachel, you and I know that the first night at camp, all the counselor goes in and she sits with her bunk or he sits with his bunk. And it's time to create what are the guidelines, what are the rules that we all are going to live by for the next six, eight weeks so we all get along. Do that with your family. Family meetings are great too, and I come up with that. So there's social pressures, family meetings. Be creative. And ask one of your kids to be the secretary. Invite everyone's participation. In our house, Sunday night after dinner, no matter what, was family meetings. It could be short, it could be long, it could, I bring a special dessert, I bring something fun to do, but it was a time for us to one, check in, two, remember what I said about building safety, talking about what does the week ahead look like, that helps children feel safe. Hey, dad's going to be out this night, mom's going to be out this night, babysitter's coming here, your swim practice here, logistics. Number two, What's everyone's screen time? Good time to bring up screen time. This we're talk about, well, what's your, what's your family mission? What's your goal? What kind of things do you care about? Do you care about helping the poor, feeding the homeless? And go right into that family contract. Put everything and anything in. I know for us, this is where we would start talking about expectation that my kids don't do drugs and put in those things because talking about it is part of it. It's even something Jada said before was it was that she could let her parents into the scary world she was in. And that was so powerful. And I'm so grateful that you shared it because I am sure that helped her heal and still helps her heal. So this is something I like to share too is what are kids really thinking and feeling? And I feel like I get to walk in this really interesting shoes in the world where I spend you know, half my life talking to your wonderful children. So one of the things, not before you enter my room, how many of you guys do that? I don't know about you, but until one of my clients said this, I realized that I often knock and open at the same time before I wait for the answer, stop. Breathe, knock, wait. Mom, it's not a good time right now. I'm talking to my friends. Okay, but I have something really important to talk to you about. Can I come? I'm going to come back. Not can I, because can I is giving them so much power. It's 
saying, I'm going to. Using the word I is a very powerful parenting technique. I am feeling anxious that you are spending so much time in your bedroom, right? That invites them in as opposed to you. When we you, we shut them down. Respect me. Yep. We just have a couple of other questions that I want to make sure we get to whenever you have a chance. So um, we have, um, I'm wondering if there's a specific language that can be used to validate stress, anxiety, and sadness that might encourage open and honest conversations in the future. So if there's uh, a specific language, language that can be used. Well, that the one I just said, I think is a great is I. I see you're looking really sad. I've noticed you, you really haven't been eating much. Is there anything I can do to help? I, I no, I hopefully takes judgment out of it. If they feel that you're coming with judgment, most of us, including kids, shut down, right? They put the wall up, whoa. But if you're, if you put yourself in a vulnerable place, you know, um, and maybe don't lump people together. I know a lot of people like to do this. Daddy and I and all your siblings think da da da. Whoa, right? As opposed to, I, I've noticed this. Um, what's another example? Acknowledging, sharing stories. I don't know what it's like to be in eighth grade right now. I remember what it was like for me. Mom, I don't care what it was like for you. Okay, it's fine you don't want another story, but I just want you to hear, I don't really know what it's like. Help me understand what it's like for you, right? Pause. Yeah, reflecting. Silence, patience. Don't get annoyed if they don't talk right then. Because I think kids are so smart especially now, that they're testing you like, oh, she's saying a good couple of lines, but can she really like stick to it? So maybe that time, just walk away. No, nope, no. Nope. But maybe the next time you try it, they'll be like, oh yeah, she's kind of building up this whole new little lingo thing going on. So something like that. Another, is that good? Mm. Perfect. And then um, two other questions. So um, what are your recommendations and strategies for helping children prepare for, cope with, and build resilience in the context of what is often experienced as the trauma around medical procedures, especially those with chronic health conditions? Well, so building resilience. Right building resilience. Um... Oh my goodness, I have so many thoughts and I actually talk somewhat in my book about this. Um, I guess is that I would get creative and I would build a team if you need to build a team. What would your team look like? And, and, and ask again, how old is the child? Who are the different people that, is there a therapist involved? Um, for me, I'm very, like to think I'm artistic. I'm not very good, but I enjoy the process. So I always have journals. Like there's tons of journals in my bookshelf. I always have crayons and markers. So even my adult children, they come, there's still the art tour in the kitchen. So just giving different ways to express the emotions because Obviously, I live my life on talking about our feelings, but not everyone is able to talk all the time. And that's where, you know, maybe they draw it. Maybe you, you know, kind of do the music like Jada. I don't know if that's answering the question, but I think when something, when it comes, one is, I love that you're acknowledging that there's trauma around this. Um, if you want, I welcome that person to email me afterwards and I could probably speak much better to that, take more time on it. Is there another question? Um, the, um, what is a good example of a consequence? Good example as a consequence. Great. I try to advise people not to use screen time as a consequence because 
to me, screen times are addiction. There's an addiction factor. So if you're using that as a consequence, it's like a no win. You're just adding a hurricane to a messy situation. So consequence, what's something, like, yes, I use the reward system, but I kind of like to go, hey, what's something we're looking forward to? What's something you're looking forward to? Oh, I really want to go on that great trip with my friends, uh, senior year in high school. Okay, you want to go there? Okay, so now you have something to start building toward that. How are you going to get there? You're going to use the car. Are you going to have money to pay for the gas? Are you going to have money for the hotel? All those things are consequences. That might be a bigger in the short term, especially with younger kids. You're going to need a more immediate kind of consequence, right? So it would be, um, hey, everyone has their chores, but if you do, 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 do this with this, this, without me having to ask you 9,000 times, you know what, one night I'll take one of your chores. I'll empty the dishwasher on your night, right? So there, it's no real sweat off your back, but you're kind of putting into something that's good for both of you. And I think for consequences, it's so much about um, being in the game, being mindful, being present with them. Um, does that does that does that make sense? I know this wasn't the original. Yeah, right. I apologize to everyone that my original disappeared. Um, but there was one other slide that I wanted to share, and it was about in order to help deal with the anxiety and the depression and all these things we talked about, I think it, now more than ever, we need to get ourselves involved in community and whatever that means to you and help your child be involved in community. And ideally a community that isn't only with people through screen time. So it, what do I mean by that is in our house, what's our passion? What's something you care about, whether it's political, charity, volunteer, um, you know, so-and-so up the street is an older woman. She really could use help with shoveling her driveway and bringing her garbage in and out. That is something a 10-year-old, eight-year-old, however old your kid can do. You can go over with them, talk to Mrs. So-and-so, introduce, ask for help, guide them, but then let them do that on their own. Simple things like that are always around us. And what I've noticed more than ever right now is how much fear children are expressing around or teens express around, I won't call and make a dentist appointment. I won't call and get my takeout food order because so much of everything in their life is like this that they don't have to be uncomfortable and they don't know how to be uncomfortable. So I'm kind of blending two different things, but good medicine for anxiety, depression is practicing things that are uncomfortable for us, but also focusing externally. If we're only focused internally, and my mentor years and years ago used to describe anxiety is that we have all these, these drunken monkeys that don't stop dancing and talking inside our heads. And when I join with a team and getting to know them, I'll say that story that I just told you about my drunken monkeys. And I'm like, man, your junk, drunken monkeys are really active today. And you'll get a little giggle. You'll get a little, yes, because what am I doing there? I'm joking a little. But what I'm really doing is I'm acknowledging that there's so much noise and that once we know and acknowledge there's so much noise, we hopefully are opening a window, opening the door that we can start talking about that noise. And that's, Jada, you mentioned that before, is learning to one, express what that noise is in our head and then learning to reframe it. Like I remember thinking, Everyone at the party was making hair fun of my frizzy hair. It's really raining here in New Jersey. No matter what I did, my hair frizzed today. Was everyone in eighth grade talking about Nancy Kristen's frizzy hair? Probably not. Probably just the mean girls that bullied me in the bathroom that made fun of my frizzy hair. But I didn't 
have the courage or the vulnerability to share that with my mom. Or if I did, I don't remember what her response was. So for me, that left an imprint that then created a pattern that was part of my drama story. I hope that's all making sense. Do we have Absolutely. time for more stories? I have more, <laughs> more well, questions. We have, we have, thank you so much, Nancy. This was so helpful and enlightening. And I think uh, shared a lot of great information with folks. We have a few questions um, for Jada. Um, so I want to give her the opportunity to answer them as well. Um, and so um, what I'm going to do, if people have to jump off, I just want to share a few quick announcements first, um, is that um, you will be sent an email um, that has a survey. So we encourage you to fill out the survey and give us feedback. Um, and in there, you can sign up for the follow-up conversation um, that will happen next week. Um, I will be holding a follow-up discussion to answer any more questions or um, things like that. So um, Jada, are you ready for a few questions? Yep, I am. All right, let me... Um, so first question, did you have anxiety or apathy when practicing for your bat mitzvah and what helped? I, I didn't really um, like develop my anxiety and depression until after my, my bat mitzvah actually. Um, I did have like stage fright a little bit. I mean, I, I was a, it's kind of like once I started performing or doing something, I was able to sink into it and then, and then, um, and then kind of just flow from there. I mean, I had a lot of experience performing, so it wasn't too bad for me, but I mean, for someone who doesn't have experience, I can see how, how they would have a lot of anxiety with that. Um, but deep breaths would be my biggest um, suggestion. And just knowing that, oh, you've practiced all these months to get to, uh, to learn all of your uh, Torah and all of that. So um, I think just reassuring myself that I knew what I was doing um, and to not even think too much into what I was doing because because sometimes when you think about how well you wanna do on things, it makes you even more anxious. So just a suggestion to kind of just trust yourself and and go with that. Great. Um, you also, someone wants to know, is there anything you think teachers can do or you wish teachers did when students feel isolated? Mm, that's a good question. Um, definitely for teachers to just be there for students um, emotionally um, or, or at, like they should be able to be approachable in my opinion. I mean, or a lot of people's opinions, but, but I, I mean, I've definitely had a few teachers over the years that I've been very close to and have confided in about how I was feeling or, um, and so, and so sorry, I'm already forgetting the initial question. That's okay. I think, are there things that teachers um, can do or you wish teachers did when students feel isolated? Mm. Um, I wish that teachers, one, would listen. Um, two, if, if like a student's in danger, tell their counselor or some, someone else in the school who can better help them, a psychologist or something because not all teachers are trained in mental health, which in my opinion is, I mean, they should be. Uh, I think all, all staff in schools, I think that should be uh, trained in mental health just because it's so like relevant and especially middle and high school, um, a lot of people struggle and, and a lot of people don't know that a lot of other people struggle, but there is a lot of people struggling and they just, and they don't want to reach out for help because they feel like maybe no one's there or people aren't approachable. So yeah, that, I think that there's a lot of things teachers can do, but just kind of just taking the first steps to try and, and put effort into helping. Great. Um, what would you tell a friend who is resistant to see a therapist, but the parent knows it would be helpful? I would definitely encourage the friend to see a therapist. I would tell them, well, how can it hurt? Um, it's, it could be good to talk to someone, um, share my personal experience, which is, which is a lot of what I do with, I've talked to a lot of people over time and, and, 
in my feedback, I, when I always try to, to find something that the other person is telling me and connect with it. And then, and then kind of bring in like my experience, if I've had a similar experience and tell them, so this is how it happened for me. And then this is what I did. And, and here's what I think you should do, or maybe not should. Um, I know that's like a word that people don't like to use in therapy, but my suggestion would be for you to do this. So, so you're, you're getting help. And um, so things aren't declining. Um, so, so I would, I would definitely encourage them to like, listen to their parents, which, which is very hard at this age. But when it comes to mental health, it's also very important. Great. Thank you. And then the last question. Um, hi, Jada, you're the coolest, by the way. This is, <laughs> I am wondering if you have any examples of indirect nonverbal behaviors that you would use when you were struggling, such as mood swings, irritability, things like that, something that might be identify, identifiable for someone who was supporting you. Mm, I think that Nancy talked about this before a little, but I, I shut myself in my room a lot. I was in my room all the time. That, that was pretty much it. I really didn't come out too much. Um, and I would kind of just sit on, sit in my room and dwell on my feelings. But um, if I, I did like not, I started to not talk a lot, like at dinner. So my family always has dinner together um, every night, which is, I'm not sure have different families do different things, but I mean, suggestion have, have family dinners because it's like the one time in the day where you can connect. Um, with your kids and stuff, but I just lost my train of thought. Um, mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. So so I stopped talking much. Like I kind of just was very quiet, um, and I I tried to isolate myself. I I stopped like hanging out with friends and going out, which I was doing a lot. So just realizing like the little shifts um, of of like lack of motivation or being tired. Like, as I said before, I was just exhausted all the time and, and I would complain about being tired. Um, so, so that, that's also another big thing. Thank you. Well, thank you to both Nancy and Jada for being with us and um, it was really cool that that kind of you mirrored each other a little bit with some of the things that, that you were saying and the strategies and of what you were sharing. Um, and again, uh, please everybody fill out the survey that you'll get in your email and feel free to sign up for the um, small conversation next week. We hope you'll join us. Thank you. Good luck to you, Jada. Thank Thanks you. For your courage. You're amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, Rachel. See you soon, hon. Bye.